right, time for Gadget Talk, the creative cast show brought to you by the Geocache Talk, Geocaching Network. If you're watching live, you can be part of the adventure tonight. Please join us in the chat room. Participate with others as they watch the show. The link to the chat room is on the geocachetalk.com front page. If you're listening later, please give it a like, subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, even Twitch. And now here's your Gadget Talk host, Chad Champion, a.k.a. Bounce Bounce. Great. Thanks, Gary. Do um, you want to mention our sponsor? Absolutely. Sponsor is Logwork, the creators of the fantastic logbook made with genuine write-in-the-rain paper. The logbook's designed for the micro, cont- micro containers of the, of the present and future, geared toward the hider who'd rather go find a gadget cache than doing cache maintenance. Find them at logwork.com. Back to you. Perfect. Well, we'd like to welcome DJ W House, Dave Wagner, to the show. So if no one knows about Dave, Dave has a great series mainly in Chicago called Wired Caches or Get Wired um, there. And he has some out of the Chicago area. Um, and they're great caches if you have a chance to find them. I actually had the chance last summer to head up there with my family and we found quite a few of them, and they're, they're amazing caches. Thank you much. How are you doing, Great. everybody? How are you to the chat room? Yeah. Good to have you along, Dave. This will be a fun night. Yes. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about, obviously, internal powered caches. Um, and Dave is very good at this because a lot of his caches are internally powered, and he is an electrical engineer, so... Uh, this is the kind of stuff that he did or did for a living. So he's very good at them. So, um, Dave, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself or why would you internally power a cache? Oh, sure. Hey, howdy, everybody. I'm hoping to get some questions tonight if we uh, head off in the wrong directions and so on. Um, as Chad mentioned, my background is, is uh, electrical engineering, so that enables me to make uh, – Mistakes faster maybe than other people do on caches. Hmm. And, um, I keep learning from that and uh, advancing as I go along. So um, I think I started, I found someone's doorbell cache uh, a while back, and I had actually a doorbell in my box of wishes and uh, got that going, got it out, and favorite points were flying in. I started to buy some components, soldering iron things. I kind of got back into the business, let's say, and uh, building caches. So um talking to chad a little bit about in fact chad and i've talked quite a bit about how to power caches uh he has some particular challenges in his suitcases and the challenge uh the the caches i have so uh we talked a little bit about uh different ways of doing that and the topic of internal and external power uh came up so um something i've done both of and uh have found some pluses and minuses either way and thought tonight i'd share a little bit about maybe some of uh, the things we've learned as we've gone along and so on. I did want to say before I start, I don't want to step on any toes because I don't have uh, the right answers. I've got a lot of answers and I can tell you for a long time about how they are right, but I, I, they aren't the right answers. But internally powering caches, I, I really think is a good thing. I've done it as well. And my favorite way of doing that or the, my favorite thing is, is with a nine volt battery and using it as the top, you know, essentially putting up against a couple of bolts or finding where to put it in order to power up caches and things like that. So um, I think it, if it's the easiest way to get a cache in the field and it gives you less to worry about and every cache that's out is better than the one you dream about that you never get to implement. So internally powered is a great thing and I, and I think it's a, a good way to go. But we're here tonight to talk maybe a little more about uh, internally powered caches. So let's start with, um, you know, why would you want to internally power your geocache? It sounds like it's maintenance. It sounds like it's problems. It sounds like it may be some work and it, it may be uh, at times, um, but certainly from a convenience perspective, maybe a weak argument, you could say not every cacher carries every kind of battery uh, they may stumble across your cache. They may not read the cache page. Who doesn't read the cache page before they go hunting <laughs> caches, right? None of us. We all read them every time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I, I'm always disappointed if somebody can't um, access or solve a, a cache. So it's nice to be able to do it if you can do it in a way that doesn't 
hitch on maintenance and things like that. So probably the, the, the biggest and the, the first um, reason I headed towards internal caches, and, and I think uh, uh, Chad's got a picture you can throw up there, but basically um, early on in, in my Wired series, I got to do, uh, I whizzled myself into West Bend Cache Bash and said, hey, I'd like to do a geocache for you guys. And um, the one you see here with the door open is um, one that was done in 15, 2015, something like that. And during Omega, you're not going to expect a lot of people to bring batteries. And, you know, the mass of people running around, maybe somebody's got them, et cetera. But I really didn't want to go to where it had to be um, people plugging in and, and taking out batteries. So that got me kind of in the direction of doing it. Also, you can kind of see sometimes style-wise, it's a little hard to put a battery holder in uh, tight quarters. Um, Mont Bons, you do a lot of uh, urban hides. And uh, you know, if you, you want to ha hide the battery holder, you don't want it necessarily sticking out. So there's a little stylized advantage to it, uh, but certainly a mega is, is kind of where, uh, where that started. So yeah. um, one thing I know we're, we'll get into tonight, and that is, um, the, just my initial thought is always, well, if I put a battery in, it's going to be dead. And that, I know that's something we're going to cover tonight for everybody to understand. But I think is that, well, you're an electrical engineer, so you probably knew more about it before, before you, the common thing that you hear when people ask about. You would think so. <laughs> okay. You'd think you would. Maybe not. Okay. All right. This will be fun. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, so let's just hit that right up front. So, what what the first problem was uh, was how many batteries for how long and we're going to go through that a little bit tonight in a, in a not a very complicated way because uh, you want faith and assurance that it's going to last through the event and so on and um, the the version you saw there for the mega had three slots in it I did a version that had four slots uh, locally the year before so this was sort of a remake mm -hmm. uh, that one had rechargeable batteries. And uh, I thought it was very clever to do that, uh, being electrical engineering. Of course, I've changed those batteries every single year since um, and had to put in new ones uh, to recharge. They didn't do what I expected them to do. And I learned a lot more about it and, and hence maybe some of the discussion we'll have in this show. Uh, how long do batteries last? What works? What doesn't? Uh, I, again, I think I've made all the mistakes up front uh, <laughs> through trial and error, which seems silly, but... I understand when I'm done why it was a mistake. So that's right. the good news. Yeah. Cool. Well, and yeah. I will say one reason why I switched to internally powered batteries uh, because I used to use a lot of nine volts, especially for the the caches that we've actually built for the show, the LED decryptors. Is a lot of people do not carry a nine volt battery, and in the logs they'd put I spent five dollars going to Safeway to pick up a, a nine volt battery, and you know it only took a few minutes to to find the cache, and so. Kind of got i kind of felt bad for cashers having to go spend five dollars on a battery um so it's fairly all my caches are close to me so it's easy enough for me to stop by and, and power or change the batteries out if i needed to you got it so um to to maybe make the extreme case if you throw up the next shot there uh, chad um sometimes the cache is bigger than a couple of batteries will handle <laughs> all right and um, th this may or may not be well known by everybody in the show, but 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 basically this thing, um, when it was being put together, I think I had a, like a 10 amp power supply and it blew it. I mean, it didn't destroy it, but it didn't keep up. You know, it, it had a shutdown because it, it overheated. Sometimes caches can be bigger than what batteries can support. So mega may be one reason. Um, sometimes the power requirements are just a lot more than what you can do with just simple batteries. And the next one there, Chad, too, can... By the way, that's in the book. Yay! I love that. And Hoot. that one, from finding it last year, um, when we're talking about battery power and, you know, it may you may need more power than, than people can bring, you can spend an hour at that cache, right? And you have lights and sound and all kinds of stuff going. So this is a per perfect example of why you'd want to internally power a cache. Right. And, and uh, the, the, the cash owner, the, the, the gentleman who is the, the creative mind behind it, I guess, um, we started, we started, he started filling my bucket with things to add. And I started uh, replying with uh, how many batteries he would need. 
<laughs> and how long it run and things like that. So eventually it ended up with um, a wheelchair battery, I think is the uh, 12 volt wheelchair battery. And he ended up installing a 12, excuse me, a, uh, a solar array. Um, you can cool. see in the back right of the picture there, there's actually a solar array to keep it going. Um, this thing runs uh, day and night. So there's lights on it when it gets dark at night. And for the winter time, you need actually quite a bit of power to keep things going for that time. So um, in the end, it might have been cheaper to run electric out there than it was to <laughs> keep well, power requirements. If you get a group that goes out there, everybody wants to play. Everybody, you know, so so you get eight people out there. All eight people want to do it. Or in, in Chad's case, if his son solves it too fast, then he's got to do it, too. You know, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and he went with the full experience from a lighting and sound perspective. Right. Uh, the, 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 the Arduino portion that I was mostly engaged in uh, is minuscule in terms of its power consumption compared to the display on the inside. It, it's, cool. it's pretty awesome. He did a great job. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the power and the sound and the lights and everything that really give it the wow factor actually when you're out finding that cash. I mean, that really makes a huge difference yeah. on it. Yep. So Ch Chad, you mentioned about nine volts. We'll bring up the next one here. The, the, this was, uh, the first, uh, Arduino cache they made. It was wired number two, knock, knock. Mm -hmm. And on the bottom there, and, and I've actually got one here. Um, I can kind of show you the, the, the weird little battery holder, uh, here is, as well. Um, it ran a little nine volt, uh, battery. I thought, Hey, that's going to be a great thing to do. Um, I think this is like for rockets or something like that. If you're shooting up rockets, it, it keeps everything very, very secure in here. Uh, very, you know, rugged for, for G's and things like that. But, um, back to the photo, I put, I put that and ran it on nine volts, uh, ran the Arduino off of it. And I thought, oh, this is a good, a good deal. Well, it wasn't long before I got that same kind of a message. Hey, I'm out at your cache. I've already gone through one battery and I'm going to get another and please help. Um, Nine volt battery is is quite the weakling. There, there's no question about it. It it gives you nine volts. It sounds big, but actually it, it's really really weak. We'll get into that a little more later. But I had put too many lights, too many flashing things. I mean, I this is my first big Arduino cache, so I threw everything in the kitchen sink in there uh, to try it. So I had to go back and rip things out, uh, reduce the power consumption. And this last year I actually went and converted it from external power. Uh, to internal power, primarily because of the reliability of the contacts with the batteries. Enough batteries get shoved in there and out and so on. Eventually, those tabs uh, start to wear and tear. And to kind of get back to it, I'm finding that the batteries on the inside can last dramatically longer than a battery holder on the outside. Now, mm. uh, th there are probably 9-volt battery holders that are, that are better. Um, I've seen different types. There's no question that it can be done. It can be done well. Uh, and it's a convenient little, you know, battery to do. But I went internally powered with AA batteries eventually because I got tired of pulling this thing down and, and fixing it essentially. Sure. Uh, because of, of battery issues. So so nine volts, uh, they can work, but uh, not necessarily so great. So the next one, maybe to emphasize that a little bit. Oh. Um, hey, Rocky. How about uh, or Darth Vader? Number four, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. So this was the uh, Omega two years later. Um, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to experience this. This started out, um, and I think it was High Liston was the cashier who made the cash. Uh, don't shock the goat. Great idea. Uh, <laughs> he helped me along. I copied a lot of what he did to start, learned a lot from his experience. And I ended up making three of these, one externally powered uh, and, and uh, one internally powered. This one for the mega, it the the, the mega is not till August and it got done about May, so you have a lot of time to tinker and add. So I ended up adding audio and MP3 clip files, and a lot of things went into this one that weren't originally planned. To the point of where not only did I start to need uh, you know batteries to to run this thing, but I started uh, let's say bricking up the battery holders here. And, uh, <laughs> joining them together because uh, there there had to be enough to go through the number of, of minutes of play. So, you know, here's here's again another example perhaps of oh yeah, hang on. combination of the time it takes. There you go. So these are just uh, uh, three packs of batteries. There's 
hot glued to, to double, and then I've even doubled it again type of thing. Um, basically, not only was the amount of power consumption relatively high, but the um, time it took to solve it was, was a lot longer than I, I thought it was. Some folks get through it fairly quickly, but people were spending a lot of time on it. And so, uh, again, we can kind of cover this a little later. Yeah, but, I going to say, Dave, but we'll have to walk it up. We have some audio listeners too, so we'll have to go through that particular uh, way you did that. That's pretty cool. I've and never- that's, if I'm doing my math right, that's 18 volts. Well, so this is is so what you're looking at is um, a three double A battery holder, and the three double A batteries are in uh, series, so you get like four and a half, five and a half volts out of that. And then what I've done is I've taken in. Quadruple bit. <laughs> them back to back. Right. So that now I've got six, but they're in parallel with each other. So this is still three batteries, but now there's three and three in parallel. And then I've wired that up to another set of three, three. and three. Okay. So I've got 12 batteries all running basically at five volts, four volts, depends what you convert up to. Um, and the reason to do this is basically I've got four times the play time. Uh, right. and, uh, that three batteries would normally provide. So, right, and and this is not unusual to do for uh, megas for me, but for a local cache, um, I might only stick in just three batteries or four batteries and not have to mess with it for multiple years. Okay. Uh, it, again, it depends on on where you're coming and what you're doing with it. So, so there's an example of of one for megas. I think it's just convenient. It's convenient for the a casual cashier who comes by may not have the resources he needs. Nine volt batteries are nice because there's enough oomph there to drive Arduinos and things, but they're weaklings. And then you just get into the situation of where you've maybe embellished your cache to the level of lights and cameras and sound. <laughs> you just need more power. Okay. And, right. and, and you can't have somebody bring, you know, a 12 pack of batteries uh, to power your cache either. So uh, that's kind of the gist of some of the reasons why, you might do that. There's probably a little bit of uh, style points, not having to, you know, show uh, the battery holders and things like that. There's a little bit of, I think, maintenance advantage in the sense of you don't get corrosion in the context of wear and tear as batteries uh, go in and out. I have replaced external battery connectors and holders. I've not, re- I've replaced those more often than I have the batteries on the inside of the ones that are internal. So a lot of positive things to say that internal is not something necessarily to be afraid of yeah um, yeah that's that, that's a really good point because i guess because if it's if you have those external they're in the they're in the weather so i mean potentially you could put a cover on them but still you're you forget that those things are out there and they're metal and so they're gonna get moisture well, and even if you put them in a waterproof container uh you're gonna get condensation in there right. at some point so um, I've had a couple nine volts where they've corroded and I've had to replace them and actually right. replace the, the battery mount too. Right. So, so to, uh, on the corrosion side, if, if, if batteries in it or not in it, uh, the corrosion in the same environment, uh, an ammo can would be the same, but sure. uh, when people are putting them in, taking them out, putting them in, taking them out, you also have the mechanical bending and flexing and all that stuff. And I think that that somewhat aids to it. Um, I tend to put, you open the box, there's the cache, but in the back of the cache, so they're a little more protected from moisture is where I'll, I'll have the battery. So it can be a little bit advantageous that way. So that's a lot of good, you know, maybe a lot of whys of why I like putting them inside. No, that's good. Um, as far as what I've learned, we talked about a few of them, like nine volt batteries really suck sometimes. <laughs> um, I got a couple just thoughts that go with that. And, and Chad, if you got, uh, I think, number five there. And, oh, no. Back up a little bit. Back up one more to the seven segment. There you go. Oh, seven segment? Yeah. There we go. So the, 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 the one thing I love about an internal battery is that little yellow button. In fact, there's a convenient yellow arrow uh, pointing to it, which is the try me button. Okay. If you build a cache and this one has no Arduino in it, um, there's a bunch of magnets that get placed um, on 
portions of the cache here and it activates the magnetic read switches behind. When you have that yellow switch, basically mm -hmm. the only time the battery gets used is when someone hits the switch. And any cache, any cache, I don't care what kind of battery, whatever is in there, if you just have push the button and it lights or does something and it's like five seconds on, you're not gonna replace the battery. It's going to basically um, you know, corrode, weather away, you'll have other issues, but anything with a push to test or push to try or push to activate button, it isn't powered up all the time. It doesn't take any power until you push the button. And, and we're talking Narn Arduino for the most part here. Um, you're gonna get a lifetime out of that battery. And, and I think we'll, we'll hit it a little later, but Chad's project uh, last week with the nine volt battery in the box, it's just a few seconds, right? Uh, to hit that. Yep. So Dave, a question from the chat room about batteries in cold weather. What's the, what, what have you experienced you, you two guys? So um, definitely, definitely. And I'm going to, I'm going to maybe show, show a couple of batteries. We actually we have that uh, topic here at the very end, but yeah, we're going to hit that, we're gonna hit that at the end a little bit in terms of figuring this out. But um, the, the two batteries, whoops, let me go the right way. The two ones I'm showing here, a, a typical um, alkaline AA battery, okay? Right. And we've got Dave's favorite, which is the expensive but Energizer Ultimate Lithium. It has a lithium, lithium component to it. Uh, it has some patents, unfortunately, which is why nobody else makes them. But Energizer, oh, and wow. they charge you uh, Arm and a leg. money for these. <laughs> but I'll say a couple things. So... One is just batteries don't work well when it's really cold, okay? Um, like your car battery, like any other battery, they don't work when they're really cold. However, some batteries are much worse than others. And I'll take our nine volt uh, battery as the, the general example here. Uh, it was a weakling to begin with. And if you don't have this uh, close to your body in your pocket in the winter time and you try to use this, it will uh, it will fail you. It, it will be producing six volts, five and a half volts. It won't give you a lot of oomph kind of a thing. Um, the regular amp lines, they have a lot more energy in them, or the double A's have more energy in them. And so they're going to survive a little better. But if they're cold, they aren't going to do the job. This uh, Energizer Ultimate Lithium, again, not to do the commercial, but is... Yeah, they're not a sponsor, Dave. Yeah, so right. But they, but they are a battery that are meant for outside thermometers, uh, for weather stations, things like that. And, and the, the chemistry on this is deliberate to operating uh, very well in cold weather, okay? I've got a couple of caches that um, have not operated in cold weather, uh, but the case was like a minus 10 situation. I don't know why they were out there caching. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have a particular um, slide and one that doesn't like really cold weather. But for the most part, uh, you know, freezing weather, sub-freezing weather, uh, this Energizer lithium battery is is good. Um, Tom, uh, you had an extra question there about the, yeah. you know, are they safe or fire hazard? Right. I mean, these, these are, quote, unquote, no different um, than a uh, AA from the general usage, but they do have a higher energy density inside the cache. They're not going to... They're not going to uh, get punctured. You're not going to drop them. Right. Um, you know, so they're safe and sound inside the, the geocache. So not much of a fire issue and so on. Probably the only uh, handling issue might be if I am uh, put a drill through it when I'm putting something together. Sure. Uh, that caused me some issues. But these are not at the energy densities of your lithium batteries that are in cell phones. Right. Okay. Right. And so, I think what he's thinking of is, are these, these are the 18650 lithium batteries here um and these are these are the exact same batteries in a tesla and these actually are they can be a fire hazard um especially when charging they can actually catch on fire so um, i think that's what he was thinking of right and and uh, the, the, bad, the bad news are these aren't rechargeable uh the good news are once i stick them in a cache generally i'm not replacing them until the cache kind of dies anyway uh, the question I'd asked about hot weather, we must hit that. Yeah, uh, just finding our way, I had the same question I thought about was the opposite, which is what if we go the opposite direction? <laughs> so um, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a battery expert. Uh, batteries prefer hot from an operating perspective. 
but most batteries will self-discharge when they get hot. That's why people sometimes say, keep your batteries in your refrigerator if you're gonna keep them for a couple of years because the cooler they are, the slower they internally discharge, okay? Um, point again, why this is my favorite battery is lithium is, is one of the chemical processes that is very, 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 very slow to degrade in the sense of these are like, a in my mind, these are like a five year on the shelf battery. Oh, and wow. The line is maybe a two year. Um, okay. So most caches see nobody for six months and then sure. they have a flurry of activity and go out. So if you've got this thing um, self-discharging over the summer because it's baking and hot, by the time it gets to winter, it's gonna be pretty empty. Again, I like this one because it is uh, by design less likely to discharge through high temperatures. Okay. Right. So not, you could not total expertise, but that's kind of the gist of why this one right. it's got a plus in my a plus on the cold and plus on the hot. Okay, cool. Yeah, because I think you were talking about earlier too is you, you can plan for that. Like if you if you're gonna bring it out for a mega or something big, some kind of big event, you can plan for your battery use for that. But like you said, on a normal if there's you know and of course it depends on where you are in the world. I mean you might get hit if it's in, you know, a downtown of a, you know, if you're lucky enough to put it, be able to put it in a high frequency area versus out my way, <laughs> East Texas, uh, we don't have as many cashers, but you're right. That's a, that's a good thing to think about. Yeah. So my biggest concern on a hot situation is that the battery will degrade with time. It doesn't even have to be used. It just degrades with time. And again, that's why I kind of tend towards the energizers here. Um, by the way, uh, lead acid batteries, other batteries, um, uh, rechargeables are horrible. They get hot. They they basically lose 30% of their charge. And on the cold side, not many cashers come, yep, come out in the dead of winter. Uh, but if they do, you'd like it to pretty much uh, operate and function as you'd expect kind of a thing. Sure. Makes yeah. sense. But temperature definitely makes a big difference. Fortunately, Unfortunately, and fortunately, caches don't come out in the cold so much for me, uh, but I don't have the Arizona heat to deal with. Maybe people don't buy as much in the heat of the summer either. I don't know. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. So, so on, on, if, if you have your cache design, one button, push the button, it operates. Uh, your battery is going to last forever. I mean, so put it inside. All right. The next, the next one there is the door switch, and that's the uh, pieces of eight again. Chad, there you go. There should be one further down that's got the, there you go. Oh, there we go, cool. All right, uh, we're gonna go to the to the, the electric cam here in a second, but let me just talk what that is. I, I love the magnetic uh, door switch, okay? And under the orange arrow there, you can see um, what is the door switch, and it's a, a reed, magnetic reed, and on the door itself is, is the magnet, essentially. Um, these are great. You open the door and the, the cache powers up. You close the door, the cache uh, powers down. If, if you go to the, the, the little cam kind of oh, like, I like that. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. I'll, I'll go to your little cam there, Dave. So yeah, um, you probably can't hear this. Let me see if I can, I got to hear it too. Oops. All right. At that distance, the switch is opening and closing. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so typically you could hear the read switch open and close, but I, I can't hear anything myself. Yeah. I, I think if the audio is not picking up, the mic's on the other side. Oh, yeah. Makes but sense. That, that's all you have to do to get. Now, um, wood warps, warps. And um, the nice thing about these is even if your door gets warped and these become misaligned in some way, uh, your, your cache will power down if this even gets right. slightly close. Um, this particular switch has got three connections, uh, common, normally open, and normally closed. A lot of the alarm circuit switches that you get are going to do you no good because they're going to be um, normally, uh, normally open. And when you close your window to secure your house and the magnet gets close, it completes the circuit. Okay, it, gotcha. it closes the switch. That's the opposite of what you want if you're switching an internal power in your cache, you really want, when the door is open, you want it the switch to be normally closed. So it's 
operating and closed. When you close the door, the magnetic comes near, then it opens it up. So it's a normally closed. Um, this, this style or version from Amazon here, I know it has both. <laughs> I bought the wrong ones before because they're unclear. You know, those great descriptors in Amazon, how, how they tell you it works. Um, so at least I know there's a normally closed and a normally open on here uh, that I can do. So th that works great. Um, it's nice because the doors can warp, things can move, and you can be assured that your cache will turn off. And as long as no one walks away with the door open, uh, sure. your batteries are safe. So Tom said in here that uh, the reason why you couldn't hear that is because your mic is muted for your phone, which is true. Oh, yeah. It's very well, true. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Well, you know, and, I, I guess that's something, too. You guys have run I mean, something you guys have, you ran, probably ran across early on. I had a small uh, cache that had a – but I had no way because it was – sort of purchase but it, it had an on off switch and of course people aren't going to turn <laughs> what what's human nature they leave it on and walk away so i mean i i like to that's why um like you, the one that you have a yellow button there dave is somebody pushes the button and they forget and they walk away it's got is it somehow designed so that without any so that, yeah, yeah so that's called a momentary switch yeah so it only activates when you actually push it as soon as you release, it's back off again. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and I and I saw a comment there about refrigerator switches. I mean, they they work and do the job. Um, I've not had a lot of experience with them, other than when I've looked at them. Sometimes they're a little more pressure to close them, so they're a little more in terms of activation. Right. But if it if it uh, you know that you close the door and it has to turn it off, that's that's a great way to do it. So refrigerator switches, you know, the little uh, it's almost like this, but with a long stick coming off the top. And when the door when the door closes, it just pushes that big stick in. Okay. Uh, type of thing. Some th you know th this requires like zero force. It's it's a non contact magnetic. Okay. But those will certainly do the job. And, and again, you know this might be a cool solution, but if you got a switch and it works, and you get the cash out and it does your job, great. You know, getting sure. there accounts not necessarily style. These are just some ideas on ways you might want to do it and manage it no that's good that's good because you know like you said you think ahead a little bit about your design and you know people do you know i i, I saw it all the time even though i put a a pretty good <laughs> pretty good description on it please turn this off when you leave it yeah people forget okay. yeah i use momentary switches on 99 percent of mine just because yeah. the fact that someone will leave it on yeah, yeah. makes that's a that's good though those are good ones it's good Good planning for that. Yeah. So so the, the brilliant electrical engineer, which I'm not, basically in his second cache had the 9-volt battery and put in way too many LEDs and sucked the thing dry and the contacts were out. In my third cache, which you mentioned, Gary, in your uh, your, your two one book. Yeah. 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 yeah, the Simon one, I actually had a toggle switch and the cacher flipped it on and I relied on them to flip it off. On the yeah. <laughs> that lasted three cachers. Don't do that. <laughs> now, some people will actually uh, have internal batteries, and then you got to bring one more battery to actually oh. activate the cache. Oh. Yeah, that's true. I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. So the cacher could still, though, leave their battery in there on accident and uh, run the batteries dead, but it's another way of doing it. Yeah. So I, I eventually installed a little lever when the door closed that physically push the push button shut. But again, I've made every mistake I can. So this is this is a micro switch next. And this is on the bottom of that Darth Vader um, cache. And, and this is a little different version of it. But the micro switch is a very, takes very little um, mm -hmm. effort to close it. And the reason, if you throw that picture back up, uh, Chad, the reason I went to the um, micro switch on the Darth Vader cache. We talked about the the audio uh, capability and stuff in there. It took too much power for the hall, the, the magnetic switch, read switch to work. So basically on the TARDIS uh, that we showed it earlier, right. we burning up switches left and right. Oh my. All because I didn't realize, I didn't, you know, I just threw it in there. I knew what it, I'm an engineer. I know what I'm doing, right? <laughs> So I threw that in there. We kept burning them up, and we eventually put a micro switch to replace it. It just couldn't handle 
uh, the surge of current when it turned on. It, mm. it was within range maybe for operation. And in the Darth Vader one, it was basically the same thing. And you got to believe it. You know what's going to happen. Somebody um, closed the door and it was a little bit ajar a bit. The wood had warped a bit and the batteries had drained out. So a few weeks after the Mega, everything worked great. Um, that one, uh, the batteries drained out. So I went back in, adjusted the switch, brought a, a wood plane out, and I'm planing the door out in the middle of the woods and mm -hmm. eventually got that one to go. So I'm not a fan of micro switches, but you can't use a hall switch if you've got a high capacity uh, cache. So if you're putting a solenoid in or you're putting something that that switch is going to support a bit of current, uh, not a good idea. So the hall switch is good for lower power. Be aware, I've learned that the hard way, not good, so good for, for higher power, which takes me maybe to the next approach, which is maybe something I would do that not many people would do, but I just want to mention it exists, and it's on the next photo here, is after the batteries were drained and I had to replace them completely on the Darth Vader one, um, and, I, and I didn't have to fill them with all of them. Yeah, so from that one had the switch and right. go to the, uh, the next one again. Rocky. Uh, I, w I went to the software controlled um, switch. Okay. Okay. And, and, you know, and it's a tiny little, uh, let me go here. Oops. Fine. I'll get the picture in the middle here. There we go. go it's, it. it's not a very big um, uh, circuit. I can tell people what this is and get them the, the info on it. It's got a dozen pins or so, but basically the power comes in and you can electronically turn it on, you can electronically turn it off, and billionths of an amp is all it takes to, to run this thing. So it runs forever, doesn't use any power, but now the Arduino can turn it off. Or, you know, you can have some other mechanism that, that electrically turns it off. So um, so back to the cache picture there. Oh, that's good. So, yeah, Dave was showing the little um, microchip. What, do you, what, is, what is the... I guess the descriptor of that. So this is a, 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 a I call it a software controlled uh, software controlled switch. Okay. Uh, Pololu is the one who makes this particular one. It's uh, part number is two eight zero eight. I've referred to it so many times. I've got that memorized. Wow. Okay. And, and basically, uh, you can you can put switches on it. You can put Arduino on it. It can be controlled in multiple ways: uh, power to power on to power off, etc. Um, you could put a switch on the door, and the door just controls this. Right. All the current goes through this instead of this will handle, you know, 10 amps or 15 amps. This is uh, cool. not trivial in what it'll do, but it's a very little circuit. And so when I went to the, uh, here's Rocky. That was the area where I started the push the button. It powers up. And when it's figured you've walked away because you're not pushing buttons, it waits a few seconds then it powers itself down. Um, if I don't mess up the software in the Arduino, and again, this is a, a little different way of doing it, um, but I've never had it um, uh, run out batteries because it stayed on. Basically. Yeah, that's a great. You know, like you said, that's really the really the best way is to have it so that regardless if there's no activity, it'll show, it'll power down. Right, right. And and, and I'm, I'm I'm not sure um, this thing is not very expensive or very complicated. It might be something that could be put into a non Arduino cache um, with with push buttons and things and a little timer or something that would power itself down, kind of a thing. Anyway, uh, but most of the non Arduino style caches, you also can stick with the, you know, push the button and test the solution, kind of a thing where you don't need to worry about that anyway. So right, that, yeah. that's cool too. And there's many different types of momentary switches. That's that's a really nice arcade one, uh, but you can go a lot smaller if you have a smaller cache. Exactly. You know, and they actually have uh, waterproof ones, which is I have had several of the waterproof ones out in the weather for over three years now, and I don't have any issues with them. They're awesome. All right, so um, that that was so we've talked about why why do it. We've talked about some of my. Uh, insights after making mistakes and how I've wired up caches. Uh, and it gives you some options on, on how to internally power caches. Kind of the last thing I wanted to do, and this is, it, it's a bit of a nugget. Uh, don't be afraid because there's math involved. It's just division. Uh, but I think one of the big things is, well, how long will it last? I have found 
that my rechargeable batteries, my external batteries uh, have been maintenance issues for me and the internal ones have not been maintenance issues for me. But how do you know that? Well, you have to know a little bit about batteries and then a little bit about how much current you're using. So I'm, I'm gonna take a just a minute and make a bit of an analogy here. But if you remember the analogy, the chart can stay up there. If you remember the analogy, this will maybe help. This chart, you can find similar things all over the internet. Um, basically, it gives you different battery types, which you should recognize. The capacity to think of it is the fuel tank, right? It's your vehicle, it's your car, and that's the fuel tank. And so bigger batteries have more gas, okay? Smaller batteries have uh, less gas, that's, that's very true. And then what it says, typical drain is something also to be aware of when you're powering internally or even externally. And that is sort of like the size of the engine, okay? So if I look at my nine volt battery, it's got a very small gas tank, 500 milliamp hours. Essentially, uh, that's saying you could run a half an amp for an hour, supposedly, if you, if you, you know, that's milliamps times hours, uh, 500 milliamp hours. And it's typical drain says 15 milliamps. Now I don't wanna get too complex, but basically it's like a little tiny car with a small gas tank and a small engine. If you ask that nine volt battery to drive to Florida from Chicago, it <laughs> may make it. If you ask that nine volt battery to go 500 miles an hour, which is I've got a solenoid to activate, I've got a big motor I wanna run, I wanna run this thing for an, you know, an hour at half an amp, it isn't gonna work. And, th and that's what that chart basically tells you. How much capacity does the battery have? And typically, if you're running at 15 milliamps, 20 milliamps, whatever, you're gonna be doing just fine. If you start asking it to do more, then you no longer get the fuel economy. You no longer get your 500 milliamp hours worth of uh, gas tank. In comparison, we said the nine volt is a weakling. You yeah. look at a double A battery, that's 2,400. It's almost five times the capacity. And I think the Energizer Ultimates, they're around 3,000 milliamps. Oh, okay, cool. All right, and also, Typical drain, 50 milliamps. They got a bigger engine. So a double A battery will let you, uh, they could both be, you know, nine volts of double A's or a nine volt battery, a nine volt individual battery, square battery. They both can um, have uh, nine volts, then let's say if we put them together. But the double A's will still, they have a bigger engine, provide more surge current for solenoids, for actuators, and things like that. So the, the kind of the big summary, the takeaway for this is uh, nine volt is a weakling. Uh, double A's are five times better, uh, different voltages and things like that. And you can ask them to do a little bit more. That's why they'll work better in the cold because they got a little more horsepower than a nine volt does. They're capable of putting out more power even when it's cold and they're weak and they're tired and things like that. So uh, they run better in cold weather, let's say, uh, type of thing. So, so the one nugget is nine volts kind of suck sometimes. Don't ask them to do too much is what it means. And the double A's are actually very capable. I was very impressed how much you can get out of a double A battery. Right. So, that, so that, yeah, go ahead. If you, want, if you want to put a cache out there and not have to change the battery in time soon, uh, throw a four D cells out instead of four double A, and that thing will run, was that four times as long, more than that, eight times as long? Yep, yep. So the, the, the reason I don't use the C or D cells, I could, um, and I use the double A's instead in the packs because you saw how I packed together. Right, uh, right, right. Batteries. Essentially, what I'm making is 12 amp hours here. I'm making three, six, nine, 12. I've got four packs, right? If they're 3,000 uh, per set, it's not per battery if I put them in series to make uh, five volts or whatever. But I've got essentially a D cell here, right? In, in right. The, the reason I don't do that is because the Energizer Ultimate Lithium, lithium people that I'm not making a commercial for. <laughs> well, maybe one day. <laughs> they're very they're very smart marketing people realize that I will spend uh, $2 on a battery to stick in a weather station, a double yeah. I will not spend $9 or $10 to stick a C size or a D size cell uh, in there so I just don't have to go out but every you know five years to change it there really isn't a market for the lithium battery in C's and D's. Okay. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Now that said, forgetting the cold weather, forgetting the hot weather, forgetting the hot discharge, you're absolutely correct. Still D's and C's 
will give you more horsepower and more capacity. And if you need them, go for it. I, I, I double up here because I want the cold weather. And so I'm getting the equivalent of a D by blocking these because I want this particular brand of battery. They don't make these in season Ds. By yeah. the way, they, they do make a nine volt version. Uh, but I, again, I think it's just even that's oh. too, too much money. Lithium because, nine so, volts. Well, yeah. you just proven that you know they don't have the horsepower as as right. the four double A's. Right, and and you know the Energizer lithium version is probably more like seven fifty or eight hundred milliamp hours than the five hundred. But uh, it just never to me was cost effective uh, to buy one of those. Okay, yeah. So it really does seem like, and if I'm understanding from somebody who doesn't do a lot of this, but um, is fascinated by it. If you're building a, a type of gadget cache where you don't mind, you want it to be external based on the, you know, because we were doing like the ammo can ones, those might, it, it seems like that nine volts okay for something like that if you're going to walk up, plug it in, pull, pull it out. But for internal, which we're talking about tonight, really internal is really where you want to start to think about not just trying to do a nine volt. I mean, it, it's really that's your opportunity i think would and you guys can correct me if i'm wrong but it seems like that's the perfect opportunity to not use one of those because so many people are used to using nine volts for gadget caches but i think we need to we have to kind of rethink it a little bit when you get to the when you're starting to build them with internal yeah and it all depends on how much room you have but i use a nine volts mainly because you only have the two studs you hold the battery on it it lights up the, right. the leds if you have to put four double A's somewhere, cook it, uh, connect them to studs, that's going to be a pain in the butt, and I don't, I don't know if you'll be able to line them all up perfectly. So right, um, right, right. that's why I do the 9-volt, because it's just a lot easier to, to take care of. But something you could do, um, if you and we talked about this a little more as a tot, yeah. um, is the, the four double A's with oh, the 9-volt end on it, and this will light up the LEDs. If you if you want to do that, or if you, if you have a space issue, instead of getting the longer series, uh, the longer holder for these, you can go with the smaller one. But the, and they nope. make these in AAA as well. Yeah, those are great for, um, like you said, that's really a, a really great tot. Instead of trying to carry around a nine volt and have it go out and all that kind of stuff, you could do something like that. But but still, um, if you're building an intern, if you're building a, ga a gadget cache and you're going to put them internally. <clears throat> Overall, you could do you could even do that better, I think, right? You guys would probably suggest using something like that versus putting a nine volt internally because as Dave was saying, you're gonna you might end up with a problem down the road. Yeah. You kind of set up the next oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> You've set it up perfectly, thank you. Okay. All right. Oh, there so, we go. So this this is gonna exactly Gary answer the question I, I think answer the question that mm -hmm. you. So the the calculation is, what's the size of your fuel tank divided by how much fuel are you using? Essentially, if I um, take this chart here and it's nine volts, the battery capacity is five hundred milliamp hours, and you divide that by staying within the engine size. Don't draw too much, but roughly you divide that by how much current you're pulling. And that's all it takes to say, how much time do I have? And my favorite thing is to calculate how many geocachers per maintenance run. So when I put in these batteries, I'm calculating, I will get 350 cachers with an average of this and this out oh. of this set of batteries. And if that's, so I know for Omega, that may not be enough and I might double it up, et cetera. So that's where this is going to lead us to. So let's take the next slide here and this is gary i think what you're asking last yeah. the last time we built the circuit lock i say we built <laughs> chad built the circuit lock decipher yeah so this one here that we built last month yep right and we can even comment about the one from the previous build he used a nine volt battery okay yeah and here it is that's 500 milliamp hours that's what the chart says is typical he has one led and even if you don't measure the current, I mean, you, you, you can go in um, and, you know, get a meter and measure how much current your um, geocache is using and things like that. But it's pretty easy, you know, the multimeter uh, yeah. things like that. 
but it's pretty easy to just kind of guess at it or maybe ask or look online to see mm -hmm. what kind of numbers you've got. But back to the calculation. So I've got that nine volt battery, or Chad's got the nine volt battery built in. It's got one LED on it. It might be five milliamps, it might be 10, it might be 15, but let's just say 500 divided by 10, 50 hours. So that lock to cipher should give you 50 hours of operation, which by the way is 3000 minutes. <laughs> and if you say that it takes 10 seconds to do uh, the average check, and when you do it, you hold it there for 10 long seconds to make sure that light's really lit, that means you've got you know, six per minute. So I've got 18,000 minutes of geocaching and if it's one per cacher, 18,000 cachers can visit that cache and that nine volt battery, it's a weak link, but the nine volt battery will last through 18,000 cachers. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So yeah, it's, gonna, it's gonna rot away. Chad's gonna be retired and living in Tahiti, uh, you name it, you are definitely, you're definitely going to uh, not run out of power in that nine volt battery. It's gonna self discharge it's going to just, you know, get tired with time, uh, things like that. So, so that's why this kind of a powerful, take that battery divided by how much current you're using and 18,000 cashers. I think he's pretty well covered with just nine volts. You don't need more. Right. But as you start to ramp up, as you know, you, like you said, you experienced, you go from something like that, which is really cool up to, you know, the big, the big leagues, the TARDIS and things, you gotta, you gotta start thinking about how much, how much it's going to, how much output you got. Right. Right. And that's the next chart. Cool. Oh, good. By the way, for, 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 charts. for the chat room here, we're, we're almost done. There won't be a quiz at the end, but we're almost done with <laughs> the math portion of this, but let me get, let me give you, it's two last slides. Yep. <laughs> test. Well, I was looking forward to the test. Yeah. Oh, okay. right. Test. Engineer, you gotta you gotta have calculations. So. Yeah, no, you're good. Keep going. I love it. All right, so so let's take the nine volt uh, battery and put it in our in our Arduino, in an Arduino project, just as a reference kind of a thing to your question, Gary. Great lead in again. Now I've got 500 milliamp hours, but I'm going to be pulling out 100 milliamps. Could be 70, could be 120, could be 50. Uh, you know, but let's just say it's 100. Um, it's lighting some LEDs, it's doing some stuff. And now that nine volt battery gives me all of five hours. And so that's 300 minutes. Now let's say it takes a minute and that's short. Let's say it takes a minute to solve the cache. That's 30 caches. That's not a lot. Right. So now that nine volt battery becomes woefully and it's my knock, knock horror all over. I've taken too much out of it too quickly and people are taking 20 minutes to solve and sure running off their battery. So, you know, here's the example of where you pull just a little more current. Now it's nine volt really sucks. Okay. Right. It, it isn't what you want. So for short cash, it's a great tool uh, for longer Arduino. Now last, last uh, calculation we'll do here. I'll take the Arduino project we did and I'll just take and do double A batteries. And it might be three batteries. It might be four, it might be whatever it is. I've got to convert the voltage to make it work for the Arduino anyway. There's a little electronics that can do that, or you can just run it off batteries, uh, et cetera. But either way, you don't really gain um, milliamp hours by raising the voltage. You just put them together. It's still 2,400 per set of batteries. So let me take the 2,400, not even the 3,000 that's higher, and divide that by that same 100 milliamps. And mm -hmm. now I've got 24 hours worth of time. 1440 minutes and that's 144 cashers. So in this case, I'd either find a way to make that 100 milliamps smaller or I would just double up a pack and now I've got 288 cashers if they take an average of a minute per cash, yada, yada, yada. So sure. this is the way I kind of get to the, is the bat, I'm putting it inside. Right. It's probably gonna be more reliable, but is it big enough? It has to be respectful of the size of the engine. Nine volt batteries cannot pump a lot of out. Double A's can do quite a bit more, et cetera. And mm -hmm. then just divide it out and say, hey, how long is this gonna last? How many geocachers? Um, you know, I, I might see 150 in the first year and 25 the next year. 
that's not too difficult to go two, three years on a set of double A batteries. Sure. Or if you know how many will attends are at an event, you can kind of plan for, all right, I'm going to put these in. It should get us all the way through the, through the event, maybe a few days after that. And you can sort of, like you said, you kind of plan ahead that eh, maybe a few weeks after this big event, I can go out there and sort of make it back to business as usual. You got it. You got it. Yeah. And, and, and to, to your point, and again, this is Arduino. It's for another show, so to speak. But mm -hmm. um, when I finish at the Mega, it's two days of people uh, hunting the caches at West Bend. I do have a way to push a button and hold it. And it tells me what the voltage is on the batteries. Arduinos are smart and they could just tell you, hey, the batteries are at oh, cool. you know, whatever voltage it is kind of a thing. Um, I've not often not changed the batteries after the event and because they still have plenty of time. And now you don't see but 15 cashers over the next year. So right. if there's enough at the end, if they're short, I wouldn't put in four packs of batteries. I would just put in one set of batteries because that's all it's going to need. To, uh, to get through the the next years when people occasionally stop on. Sure, no, that yeah. makes sense. And that was I was going to ask you a question: is is what's your maintenance like? Uh, your schedule for changing these out? Now, obviously, you've done the math, and you could probably go off of the logs of how many people's found it. Is that how you figure it out, or you just schedule? Hey, six months, I'm going to go change the batteries. The 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 nice thing about the Energizer Ultimate Lithium that I'm not advertising here is they will go four years and if nobody uses them they're at 95 percent of charge i mean they, they really do hold their charge unlike a typical battery so if if i don't hear anything uh, you know there's no maintenance involved typically i'm going out to a cache to maintain it uh because the wire loop game the copper wire is getting corroded and i need to sand it down i'm going out there because the lock needs to be wd 40 so my maintenance has I shouldn't say never because in the first few caches, I did them all wrong. <laughs> but my maintenance has basically been I maintain the cache. And while I'm there, I'll push the button. I'll read out the voltage. And maybe I'll want to change the batteries if they're getting down. But typically, uh, that's not been an issue. So, I mean, it's hard for me not to be a fan of internally powering caches because I found it to be the opposite of what some people have experienced. But... Rechargeable batteries I've had trouble with, contacts I've had trouble with, nine volts I've had trouble with, and that's where my maintenance was. Flipping to the double A and to that soon to be advertised one more time ultimate battery, mm -hmm. uh, it has really done me well. You know, your mileage may vary. Uh, external battery holders are great. Your traffic may be less, you know, you name it. Batteries baking in the Arizona sun, I'm guessing if they don't get a lot of foot traffic, maybe you want to put an external battery holder on and have people ring batteries you know there's just it's all up to you how you do it but hopefully this you know shares a little bit of some ideas on no that's great what's worked and what hasn't for me in the past yeah and if they're using um some kind of solenoid where you're just pushing a button the solenoid's only activating for a second to open up a door i mean those will last a long time yep exactly the same thing you know you uh, again i'm not a fan of nine volts and solenoids they do sort of work but a slightly weak nine volt sometimes won't and things like that. But you throw a couple of double A's in there, almost guarantee that you push the button, it's gonna whack it, it's gonna open it, the solenoid is gonna pop, the door is gonna open, things like that. So yeah, uh, Darren's mentioned about rechargeables. You know, that's something that I think I when I first this many years ago, but I don't know if you guys remember when rechargeables first came out, you're like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. These will last forever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And then you recharge them a couple of times. You're like, these things suck. They don't, they don't hold a charge at all. It's like, I was sold a bill of goods with these things. <laughs> and I, I use all rechargeables on my caches. Do so, you really? Yeah, yeah. I use the 18650s or uh, the lead acid 6 volt or 12 volts. Now, though, hasn't the technology probably improved from when they first came out? Well, and I don't think we have the temperature change here like you do in some areas, right? Okay. We, we kind of, we don't get extremely hot. We don't get extremely cold. Yeah. So I don't think we have the issues. Uh, I mainly use the lead acids in most caches and the rechargeable, the 18650s in my puzzle boxes. Right. Uh, JD was asking you guys, what are y'all, what are, what are y'all thoughts on solar powering? Not Should do it. 
I, uh, I know that I, I know several people that have done that um, actually gone to Harbor Freight and used their uh, solar system and they've not had an issue um, with that, uh, with the solar uh, panel, but uh, I've considered it. it. Is it overkill or what do y'all think? I think it depends on how much power you're draining. You know, like the TARDIS was taking a lot of power. Uh, you don't have a power source out there, so you had to provide it. And it needs to recharge. I mean, I guess Dave could explain it better. Yeah. I, so, so I have no agreement or disagreement with anything with solar power. I think it's – if I've got batteries on the inside and I never touch them for two or three years and by then the cash is ready to come down, um, adding a step of, of solar power in that case is, is not a necessary item. Um, but there are some caches where it makes perfectly – and I've done one solar cache inside of the library – just so I didn't have batteries in, in the library kind of thing, but in mm -hmm. uh, the TARDIS is, is solar powered. But I think um, for me, it's, it's an additional item. It's got leaves that are going to fall on it. It's got to get sunlight so much and whatever, but my caches are sitting for three months. Someone comes by, it performs well, they walk away and I've got charge for the next one. The TARDIS runs during the night. It runs all the time. It's got some lighting on it. It's always got to be whatever. It's not, truly power it down it needs a way to recharge um i've seen several 12 volt or 6 volt charge trickle charge items that are stuck out on a post and they'll run for years and years and years because they don't get much use and the solar power keeps them charged and if i didn't have energizer ultimate lithium batteries that lasted so well i might be sticking some rechargeables and solar panels in Mm -hmm. so that I could get my three years. I've got my three years, so I'm a happy camper. So I've not explored it uh, in that sense. But a cash could demand it, right? And uh, certainly that would be a way to go too. You have to put it somewhere where it's actually going to get the light. You, in the middle of the woods, you're not going to use solar panel. Yeah, There's a lot of inefficiencies. As soon as you get uh, winter time, right? You, you want it to have a lot of power because it's cold is when it's going to have the least power, things like that. So, yeah. But there'll be – I don't doubt we'll come across a design creation style that will demand perpetual monitoring of something and up for 24-7 where solar power is going to be the only way to go. Um, Sherry's want to know roughly where the the TARDIS is in the world that that, uh, that particular cache is in. Is it in Illinois? It is in Milwaukee. It's, 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 it's north of Milwaukee, uh, Glendale, I think. Um, it's actually Gary in your book, probably, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. gonna pull it up and look, but uh, yeah. but it's, yeah, it's in Glendale, um, south of West Bend, north of Milwaukee, Good Hope Road, Brown Deer Road, something like that. Uh, was it like a two hour drive from Chicago? Uh, yeah, probably a little less than two hours from Chicago. Yeah, I'm on the north side, so it's not as bad. It's worth it, yeah, just north of Milwaukee. You're correct, yeah, it's a great dusk time. Cash and, and I'm going to advertise for the TARDIS. So, uh, Doctor Doolittle, great job. If you get there and you happen to catch him during the day, I don't know what the uh, quarantining, how this all works, but he's been known to come out and uh, you know share some time or even uh, give people a tour occasionally of of some of his animal collections. You name it, great guy. But dusk is a great time to go out there too. The thing's lit up. It looks nice. Uh, it's on private property. It's on a business property. And so you don't feel uncomfortable going to it in the nighttime. Yeah, uh, Joshua has a great video on the doctor. Doctors is the title, yep. Yeah, it's a great video. And uh, I, I said mentioned earlier, Josh, I don't know if you heard me or not, but uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you, uh, I don't think it's changed. But um, you were saying that that's pretty much the best cash in the U.S. Oh, there he goes. Yeah, see, I was right. See, it's the best geocache in America. There you go. Yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's worth the um, the trek, the uh, uh, make a pilgrimage to uh, to that one because it's it's well yeah. worth it. it, it and I, I got to say, um, I'm not a fan of caches that use electronics for the sake of electronics. They need to make sense. They need to do oh. something, etc. The TARDIS is not a cache that is um, cool because it's got some electronics to get in or something, or it's got an Arduino in it. It's the whole package. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just the creative mind of Dr. Doolittle. He, he just, 
he challenged me from start to finish to figure out how to manage some of what he did. And it came out beyond what I could have uh, imagined kind of thing. So I hate to oversell it because then you go, ah, it's okay. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot more than um, something with Arduino. It's, it's a whole experience. It's great. I'm a fan. <laughs> yeah. That was uh, probably my best caching trip that I did with my family. I mean, we spent the weekend. We, we flew to Chicago, did a bunch of the wired caches, and we did the TARDIS one. Um, great time. I mean, that's all we found was quality caches. So it was great. I'd highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's definitely for another show. So I mentioned about Infernal Device. That's in uh, Oklahoma City. That's in the book as well. But um, – you know that's again that's that's a good good debate uh for some time is the 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 different versions of the uh of how to do caches but uh, what uh what dave are you planning what are some of your what are some of your without giving away the spoilers and everything but what are some things that you're either working on that you can talk about without again giving away a lot of <laughs> secrets or in general, what are some things that you're you're kind of thinking about doing? So, so um, I'll I'll give you a couple of what I've done, and not everybody may have seen, but I uh, it's a little bit of a uh, throw out from maybe West Bend. A few RFID style um, oh, cool. caches and um, with voice and so on. So, Mingo Madness would have had, or actually does have. There's a cache out near Mingo. It's just on the other side of the expressway from Mingo. Uh, nobody's quite found it too much yet because it's just near Mingo. Everybody stops and then drives on. Um, but it's it's got voice. It's got um, a nice electronics in it. I don't expect to touch that one for five years, I hope, and change the batteries uh, kind of a thing because it's a long drive. Um, and up in West Bend, I've got some talking caches that I put out last year for the event. And this year, and, and it's it's over the shoulder kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, I've got... <laughs> I do caches because I want to see if I can do it, not because necessarily <laughs> um, you you or you may or may not find uh, these as interesting as I do. Oh, but, but basically, um, I like them. I've got a a, a COVID nineteen geocache. Let's call it that. It okay. is a social distancing geocache. There are three boxes. They all have Arduinos in them, and the three talk by radio between them. And you have to solve across three. So you need a team of people or maybe get away with two. But uh, so I've got a couple radio controlled. Uh, oh, neat. Arduinos. Yeah. So they interact. So it's a team cache and uh, they'll be separated far enough. One person can't travel between them uh, to manage it. Love the it. cache idea, I think, is kind of simple. Um, but the solution and discovering it may be more complex. I'm going to do one like that. I hope at West Bend this year, a simpler version. I used for megas. You have to be a little faster in the throughput time. Um, there's another one sitting up on the shelf there, uh, mm -hmm. for the birthday celebration, uh, we've got going, um, mm -hmm. Chad, Chad had sent me this, uh, um, a scale, a weighing scale that he had found on Amazon someplace. And he's, he dropped me one in the mail. Thank you. And, uh, so I've been playing with that a little bit and I see a future cash using weights and measures. Oh, neat. There's something coming out there. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm having a lot yeah, of fun with uh, pretty simple. They look like this, yeah, just a, yeah. a load, a load beam. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, again, real quick, Chad, I, I just want to. You want to see it? Y'all can talk about it. Yeah, for a moment. Yeah, so it's just a load beam, right? So what it does is it measures electricity that runs through here, and it when it bends, it measures the amount of electricity for you you to get the uh, the the weight. Oh, nice. um, and then Dave actually found these and sent me a a link on them on Amazon. Cool. And so these are little weights that you can use on it to actually uh, oh. put on there and figure out the exact weight um, for the scale. So that's pretty cool. And that, and honestly, I sent that to Dave because I want to do a scale cache and I'm not smart enough to figure out the code. So I said, hey, I'll buy you a scale if you can <laughs> if you could write the program for it. Yeah, it, it, awesome. it got started. It isn't really going to a cache yet because of other distractions and stuff. But uh, sure. Yeah, I definitely see there's a there's a future there, um, and I think some of the wireless stuff has got me intrigued. Right. Um, the 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 bad thing would be one cache is three sets of Arduino hardware, uh, you know, in each of these kind of things. So I've probably built more Arduinos lately, 
for the for a less number of geocaches uh, lately kind of a thing. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It's it, it, it's just technology gets of interest. I don't want to do a cache that is just oh look I can do this with technology. So then how do you make it fun? How do you make it entertaining? How do you make it challenging? Uh, that kind of a thing is is where I like to go with those. So um, I've probably had the busiest I've ever had. I'm planning four caches for West Bend Cache Bash. Um, and I've got a couple that go usually out by me before that are similar, that are spin-offs kind of a thing. But uh, building is easy, getting them out and getting out and about, not so easy lately with all this. <laughs> Um, so with, uh, with Mingo moving, I think we talked about earlier, you're still hoping to come down for the, um, for the gadget slash creative cash build round table. Yeah. I'd love to come out. Uh, hopefully this is interesting to folks. Mm -hmm. Um, I, it, it's easy to get too engineerish. Uh, it's also, I don't know, sometimes little nuggets come out of the weirdest places. You, you mm -hmm. get ideas and they become something different for everyone else. And sometimes being just exposed to, uh, you know, you see it in YouTube all the time. Oh, that's cool. I bet you I could spin that to something different and it would make sense for me. So, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely looking forward to coming out to uh, uh, Mingo. And the, and the reason it works so well is because GeoCoinFest was on my agenda. And uh, seeing as that was the same date as what Mingo was. Same moved, weekend, right. I already basically had plans to, that's cool. uh, to go there. So, um, Is the one, and I want to give away the, all the 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 good stuff here but is it the one at the barn is that yours or is that Adi's that's it's the barn doors open oh i wish that was mine Adi Adi does a great job uh, that's Adi's okay cool yeah you know and, and uh, we got some great stuff at mingo right now that's yeah. awesome yeah I, it, it, other people have heard this before my wife doesn't like my geocaches in general in fact she I have, uh, the, there's one up here for, for, for West, um, I can't get my shoulders. Yeah, West Bend. Yeah, there's yeah. one up there for West Bend that she actually kind of thinks is cute, but she loves Adi Olson caches. I mean, it's, they're it, right. yeah, they're, they're awesome. They're, they're, they're a different kind of cache and they are just fun to do, you know? Uh, and by the way, not, not to say that she liked Chad's a lot better than mine too. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> mine aren't hard. So. Your I, seven I, segment I display it. one, I would never have figured out if it wasn't for you and my wife. I'm not that smart. So I yeah, I have trouble. I think I'm making them easier and they always come out when we beta test them. Well, it might be a four. If you did this, it might be a three and a half. You know, it's like they're they're more challenging than I expect them to be. But it's kind of the nature of uh doing something different than everyone else is doing. Uh, it fills a different segment of the geocaching. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So, uh, and to be honest, I mean, I love doing this. I love building these and I just want to see if I can do it. And the fact that I get to build them and put them out is really, really good. But I don't know, sometimes just solving the problem and making it work is the, uh, for you, the fun part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Hey, uh, Jesse, do you want to pop in for the, for the end here? And I'll, I'll take off that part. It's up to you, but Je uh, Jesse's been here the whole time. He's working. Thank yeah, you, sir. I'm right behind the scenes. Y'all, y'all got it. <laughs> but uh, as we start, oh, okay. He's just uh, thanks, Jesse, for being there and helping us out. Um, I guess uh, we'll let you guys kind of start to, I guess, kind of do a wrap up. Oh, one, one other thing, real quick. Josh is talking about uh, Dave. Your knock knock cash was pretty difficult. What? Do, so. A, a cache like that, if you want to talk about that briefly, um, sure. is that um, is that also because that's another thing we really didn't get into tonight, which is you know you can make a cool uh, gadget cache, but it's very its difficulty is is very simple. Do you do you like to try to do varying ones where people spend a lot of time trying to figure them out, or because you've got the variations of making a really difficult cache versus making one that you really enjoyed, but yeah, you can walk and kind of do it pretty quickly. Right. Right. My, my intention is always, um, I want you to solve it and I want you to have a good time. It's, it, you know, other cashers say the same. I really do. I put my phone number in, send me a text. I've got canned hint selections to go. Um, when I first did wired it, it, as the builder, you don't know it. 
I would go and tap out the code and it would open every time I tapped it. And I, I almost thought about tightening up the parameters to make it a little harder. And then you beta test it and it's like, whoa, uh, this is not what I expect. Because you, you've built it, you understand it, you know sure. it. <laughs> it's it's it feels like it's a two you know but for some folks it, it, it may, maybe we have enough time to tell you a very short little story but um i lived just down the street from knock knock a, a while back and there was a a german gentleman uh came over from overseas and he was out here doing caches he run into ran into the knock knock cash and he was having some difficulty and i happened to be heading out and i said hold on i'll come by and I'll, I'll give you a hand. I didn't have many hints together at the time. And, um, he, you know, he went up there and he showed me what he was doing. And um, not to explain exactly, but it's sort of the. Um, was what he was knocking in to put a code in. And I went up there and I did the. He said like that, you got to do this and this and this. And he said. Oh, now I understand. So he goes up there and he goes, <laughs> and I and I couldn't tell that there was a difference in the cadence. He's not, yeah, yeah. People who do music sometimes knock it out of the park easily. And if you, and, I, and I'm a music person, I, that's my background. People who don't do music sometimes um, they put emphasis into their knocks. But yeah, change the time and and it's it can be a challenge. It can be a big challenge. Joshua knows. I know he struggled um, quite a bit. Anyway, but it's hard for me to feel the cash is hard until I beta test. I didn't do as much beta testing early on. Uh, right. Now I've got three people that come in. Two of them hate puzzles and are not very good at them. They say, and so I get my best feedback um, on how to change them and what to improve. I'm hoping for. West Bend Cash Bash. There's one up on the, the thing there with with uh, some candles on it. I'm really hoping that's going to be the simplest Dave Cash ever made. We'll see what people do when we beat it. What happens, right? Yeah, <laughs> but I I I I really I, I tried to make Wired Number Two hard because I thought it was going to be easy. Okay, and now I've discovered, and I had multiple steps to get in, multiple sure. steps to get in. I didn't tell you the code word. I didn't tell you the combination. You had a, you know, and in the end, I, it was just enough of a challenge just to, to solve it the normal way kind of a thing. So anyway, my intention is to make them easier, uh, but definitely fun. And sometimes I think they end up being harder than I think, and I hope people have fun. Yeah, that's great. Well, for me, that's the most difficult part on putting a cash out is after you create it, especially a puzzle. I know what the answer is, so it's I always put it as easier than what other people think it should be and so that to me that's the hardest part yeah on when you when i place a gash but um, i do like to take them to events like i'll make them into a puzzle box to test them and take them to events um and have cashers test them and see if there's any issues with them and then find out how long it took them to to find it and stuff and it almost needs to be some kind of a, a sliding scale system if it takes the cashier oh. 20 minutes then it's a two and a half or a three or whatever. If it takes an hour, it's a four. I don't know what it should be, but you know, it'd be nice if they kind of on the cash page uh, kind of referred to what your difficulty should be uh, on maybe the, the time it takes to find it. Right. And if I can comment on my caching beta tester teams, the one that don't like sure. puzzles, do like puzzles, um, we send Dave into a different Dave into the garage. And he comes back, and two minutes later, he's got the log in his hand, and he sends the next person in. And we're sitting chatting at the table, and 30 minutes later, <laughs> they come in and go, oh, how do we even get started? You know, right. so People are so good at puzzles, and some people not. And different puzzles, different people on my team have been really good at, and others have been really bad. And it, it switches with different caches. So it's so individualized, I think. There's physical caches, there's mental caches, there's puzzle caches, there's, and they all can be electronic, but, you know, depends on where your mind is at. Sometimes it's easier and harder to solve. So that's a, yeah, that's a good point. Um, some people, you know, talking in the chat room as far as you got to, you got to make a decision. You know, like you said it, um, earlier, you can make it a bell curve, whereas most people can solve it in a certain amount of time. But, um, you know, um, 
I'm kind of like Adam talking about. He's not a not a puzzle type casher, but um, maybe that's the kind that um, it you want there to you because know, you gotta have people at the at one end and the other. You're probably gonna have that anyway, but like you said, you kind of want to. And some people are. Um, S- SW Missouri Joe mentioned about he wanting some DNFs. I guess that all depends on the cash owner. I mean, like you don't want a DNF because you're saying you would give them, you'll give them hints if you need it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll say I agree with Joshua because uh, that knock knock one I could not do. <laughs> uh, I had to get my son in there and my wife who both read music to try and figure it out. So right, I didn't DNF it. I didn't log it because I didn't get into it. Um, I can't DNF it because I actually found the cash. Right, I just couldn't figure out the puzzle. So. But yes, that was a hard one. Come yeah, on. and, and mi- mixing them up is kind of nice. Uh, the wire loop style, the Darth Vader. Yeah. Uh, don't shock. That's a whole different set of puzzle than is a logic puzzle than is a um, knock knock. You know, sure. and, and again, some people. It's almost like I have fives in the group and one and a half difficulties in the same group. Sorry. Yeah, Joe's saying he preferred logs over DNF. Sorry about that, yeah. buddy. Yeah, that's that's that that makes sense. I think I think most people make gadget caches want that. They're not puzzle caches. That's a whole other story. But but most people who build, you know, good uh, gadget caches, creative caches, they kind of want there to be an experience. But come come away with it with um, still with a smiley. So um, so I guess uh, Chad, uh, up to you guys as far as you want to uh, start the process of the final thoughts. Um, um, yeah, no, I mean, I think that was pretty good. I think we answered everybody's questions. Um, and Dave did a great job at explaining yeah. batteries. Um, I know, I know, you know, what myself, you I, I know a lot more about batteries than I probably need to. No, you're um, right. So we I'm just waiting for the test. Plus end and the minus end. I, we didn't cover that. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. We were going to go over, you know, the, a few other things on there, but, you know, we'll have to to do that another time. And, and then maybe we'll have you back on. We can talk about Arduinos and then maybe what you prefer to power Arduinos with. Uh, the different types of Arduinos and stuff, I think, is uh, a good topic to get into. But tonight, I think the battery one is a very important one because we're going to be getting into creating more uh, gadget-type caches or creative caches that's going to require more and more batteries or more and more power, and internal batteries are, are really a good way to go if you can do it. Get all the puns out tonight. Thanks, yeah. Lisa. It was a battery of info. We had one earlier from uh, <laughs> Ryan that was being funny about... Uh, uh, I can't find it. That's okay. Um, yeah, I, I, or, or even RFID. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Adam's fully charged right now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, maybe even RFID at some point too would be kind of fun to 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 hear more about. At least I want to hear more about it. But I use uh, RFID on a lot of my caches, and it, it's a really easy. Not too bad. Uh, it's a fun cache to find, and, and you can really it's make easy, it's easy as knock knock, right? <laughs> <laughs> easy as that's, why, that's why I changed it. It's a fun cache to find. It's a relative, <laughs> it's a relative term, easy. Yeah, um, yeah. There, one of the nice things is is uh, I'm country mouse, and Chad is city mouse. I guess in terms of our styles and stuff, but there's a lot of commonality in the kind of things we like to explore and do and things like that. Um, as long as we aren't boring people or uh, you know, we're keep there, as long as there's nuggets that people are getting out of the experience, either to solve caches or put out new caches or to not be afraid to try experimenting, even if the cache never makes it out, kind of a thing. That'd be awesome. I mean, that's it. What, whatever it takes to encourage others to enjoy this as much as I've enjoyed, you know, uh, exploring this cache build stuff myself. <laughs> Great. Well, Dave, is there an Instagram or uh, a Facebook that anybody can follow you at if they want to little uh, learn a little bit more about your caches? Yeah, I, I, I don't have anything too formally set up, but a couple things is that I do have a YouTube uh, where I throw caches out. I don't tend to publish, um, except in special groups, the YouTube stuff on caches that haven't been released. Uh, you might see things that have been released. There's semi-spoilers sometimes, but... You know, I can I can show you knock knock all you want. You still got to go out there and solve it. So um, I've got some YouTubes. You can probably just find DJW House on YouTubes. And um, what I've gotten some good traction on lately, and I really really love to get, is uh, emails. And I send code to people. I send schematics. I send. I 
I, I spend half a day answering emails. I love it. It's just fun to talk engineering with people, even um, from everything from I don't understand anything to, hey, I'm an engineer too, and, and so on. So I have an email set up um, that I use for that purpose. It's get get dot wired w i r e d dot g c. Apparently, somebody already had get wired, so I had to do get wired get dot wired dot g c uh, at gmail dot com. Send me send me an email. Uh, what do you want? I'll send it to you. You know, I'll share it with the code. I do things. Yeah, get wired. That's perfect. Um, get get wired dot g c yeah. at gmail. Okay. And I, love, I love answering questions. I mean, and and to be honest, Chad and I do this. Adi and I do this. A variety of us, we get on and, and chat on Facebook every so often, and I don't have answers. I have opinions uh, on some things, and some stuff is like, hey, this is what I've done and how it works and so on. But um, a lot of times we're all trying to operate too much with too little, uh, you know, little battery, big solenoid, and, hey, can I get this to work? And that's just fun stuff to explore. So I enjoy that as much as the cache is. Um, I've actually, oh, by the way, done some code for Chad. But also, I've probably done code for four or five other people where, hey, this isn't working, and I'm trying to do that. Can you help me? And it's fun for me to do. So uh, get.wired.gc.gmail at gmail.com. Send me an email, and um, you know, you got questions. I, I just enjoy uh, chatting electronics, chatting Arduino, sharing what I can share. Uh, happy to do that. That's always fun. Cool. That's awesome. Um, so I guess are, are, we, is, are we are we set, Chad? Do you have anything else? And I'll... yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We'll have to have Dave back on and find out where he gets his inspiration oh. and talk yeah, about absolutely. tools and stuff. Yeah, that would um, be a great show. Because I'd like to know where he gets some of the the thoughts. If he just thinks about it out of the out of the air and it's like, hey, you know, I want to do something evil like this, or if you actually see something somewhere or find find uh, inspiration somewhere. Unfortunately, I always have a response to anything everybody says. So. <laughs> I used to drive three and a half hours down to Mattoon, Illinois to visit the grandkids and daughter and son-in-law. And during those three and a half hours down and three and a half hours back, uh, Diane's reading a book. And it is the best time to just come up with crazy stuff. And we always have notepads in the car. And then I'll just be driving along and say, Diane, get out the notepad. Write this down. And, and you know, as I'm driving, she's writing down just dumb, stupid stuff that I have to translate later. It's fun to do. I mean, it just seems like you need to be absent from life and just mindless highway is my place to create caches. It's kind of weird. Awesome. It's great. I will say I agree with that. I, I start work at, we were just talking about this. I get up at two in the morning and uh, that's the best time for me to think about stuff when I'm driving to work or driving around. Um, I, that's where all my ideas come from. This time of night, I, I'm brain dead. I can't think about anything. So. <laughs> Thanks everybody for the comments. And uh, so, yeah, this is the end of the show tonight. Remember to stay tuned. Uh, uh, Gadget Talk will be back in a couple of weeks. And if you're wanting to start the April build for the end of the month, uh, the information is up on the Geocache Talk website uh, under the Gadget Talk portion. There's the um, parts list that you'll need to do the April build. Um, do you want to let people know kind of um, in general uh, what uh, what's on what's in store for the April build? Yeah, so it's actually going to be a fairly simple build. Uh, it's it's another lock decryptor uh, system, but this time it just uses magnets. So there's no LED, there's no battery. We're going to keep it pretty simple. Um, you can do it either on a, a, a plastic ammo can or a metal one. Uh, completely up to you. If you go to the uh, the site, you can see the parts mm -hmm. list uh, on there. And then um, also, if anybody has any questions or if they have any ideas of something that they'd like to see built, uh, send us an email at uh, gadgettalkpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, I was going to bring that one up, but I don't have it. Yeah. In um, I think I That's have it. But, and I then, Dave, what, what did you have there? You, did you want to show something there? Oh, I was just flashing the camera. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, no, perfect. All right. Uh, and we'll see everybody hopefully next Tuesday uh, for Tuesdays with Geocache Talk or in two weeks if you want to watch the Gadget gadget Talk. We'll be back in, uh, we're back in two weeks. So let me do our outro, and we will see you guys next time. <laughs>